By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome to Madrid, Spain. We are here at the World Championships of Seven Point Singleton. This is the finals. And I've been told it's a thriller of a match. So we have on the left um, Juan Jerez with a deck called Red Deck Wins, which is odd because it's basically blue-white control. But more about that in the deck deck section. And his opponent is Eric Ostman, and he's from Sweden, and he's playing a deck that's called Rug Beats. So that is red, blue, and green. And also more about that in the deck deck section. Now, before I jump to the deck decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to skip that section of the video Go to the games first, maybe check out the decks later. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to go with that is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps, including a timestamp called MTG Games. So click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And also in that same description, you can find more information about the rules because this is seven points singleton, meaning that you know singleton you can only play with one of each except for the basic lands right you can play with multiple basics of course but all the other cards only one of each and some cards have points allocated to them and you cannot spend more than seven points so here you can see the points list that was used for this world championships now this is world championships number three of 2023 right so the winner will crown himself uh, you know, the champion for 2023. Now, if you think, hey, Seven Point Singleton is something for me, again, check the description below because there's a link to their Facebook group. You can join it for free. It's a great group of guys and you can join them in their tournaments that are free to join as well. And it's also a format where you can play with proxies. Um, I have been told that in this match, there are no proxies. So there are only real cards in uh, this match if you care for that. So then you have that information. Sometimes I get questions like, uh, are people using proxies on your channel? When they are, I, I mention it in the video or it's in the rules description uh, in, of the video, right? But when I don't mention it, it's usually with real cards. I prefer playing with real cards. It's just a personal preference. So, you know, now you know the, the, the story, but I'm also happy that there are some formats that allow proxies because some people you know, they don't mind and they allow playing with proxies and it's all good, you know, it's all like do what you love, do what makes you happy, you know, that's kind of my motto. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm getting adrift a little bit. Uh, let's start with the deck text. I'm going to start with the player on the left, Juan's uh, deck that's called Red Deck Wins. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Juan Jerez, so Red Deck Wins. But wait a minute, there's no red in here. Now, I've been told because I asked a little bit because I'm not that knowledgeable about Seven Point Singleton. I've made videos about it. I know the format. I've played it a little, but not as much as like the people that are really deep into it that are playing at these world championships. And they told me that usually the deck with red in it wins. So red is really a problem, uh, if you want to call it that way, in Singleton. So that's why he's called his, uh, his deck Red Deck Wins because, you know, red's going to win anyway. Well... Maybe not, because you made it to the finals, uh, Juan. And looking at your list, we see some red hate cards, right? We see the blue elemental blast. We see the circle of protection red. So those cards, of course, are great. And your opponent today is playing with red. So you're going to use those cards in the matchup today. Then when we're looking at the rest of the deck, this is really your blue-white control deck, right? It really reminds me of the deck. This is probably a singleton version of, uh, of the deck. And th the first thing that I kind of recognize uh, that it's a, the deck build is of course the color combination, but also the Disrupting Scepter and the Jam Day Tome. That's really this classical way to get card advantage in the game of magic, right? Disrupting Scepter forces your opponent to discard a card. Jam Day Tome allows you to draw a card. And then of course, if you have those two on the board and enough mana, you have card advantage. Actually, if you only have one of these on the board and enough mana, you already can create card advantage. When we're looking at the rest of the board, we see a lot of ways for Juan to, to get advantage, right? He's got a lot of steel effects, control magic, steel artifact, old man of the sea, preacher, right? A lot of ways to kind of steal the board. He can stall the board um, with um, with moat, right? He can play a moat and then, you know, nobody can attack and he can buy him some time to kind of draw into maybe uh, a steel effect or to kind of control the board. And so there's, there's just a lot of control elements in this deck. One of the things I really like looking at this list is the witch hunter. I think it's really cool to see the witch hunter here. It's a card from the dark, and it allows you to bounce creatures of your opponent. And the nice thing here is if you use it in combination with Preacher, you can use your Witch Hunter to kind of bounce the creature that you don't want. After that, tap your Preacher and say, okay, give me one of your creatures. 
oh, I just bound your bad creature. Only your good one is left. So give that one to me. So I really like that uh, that synergy between those two cards. Hopefully I can see that in action. Another card that I really enjoy seeing here is the Vesuvan Double Gagger. Now, a nice thing to note about Seven Point Singleton is that Fallen Empires is allowed in this format. We don't see a lot of Fallen Empires in this list, by the way. We do see one card, Aioli Pile. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. It is really one of the best cards in Fallen Empire because it gives access to direct damage in every single deck because it's a colorless artifact for two. So you play it for two, two uh, tap and sack and you can deal two damage to any target, right? So it's a, it's a really good card. It's a, it's a really useful card. I'm not surprised to see it here because it's a way for, of course, uh, Juan to just have some direct damage in the deck and you, you never know what is good for and they're usually targets anyway and maybe you need those two points of damage to kind of close the game who knows um before we start with uh with the deck of eric one last card i want to highlight here and that's amnesia i think it's super cool i gotta laugh a little because i love the art of amnesia i just i think it's fantastic and when you see a card like this in the deck you know you're looking at a control deck right because amnesia is really your long-term card you're not going to play that if you're planning to win in in the early game right if you're playing aggro you're not going to play this card so it's really clear to me that he's going to go for the uh the long term long game strategy now let's take a look at his opponent eric and see what his plan is and here we see the deck of eric so this is red blue and green it's called rug beats and it's lo looking really really strong at the top here we see uh, the pointed card so we see ancestral recall disintegrate and regrowth and uh, i've been told that it's quite exceptional uh, for players to go for ancestral recall in this uh, points system and also with this color combination the reason for that of course is you only have seven points to spend for example a fireball is three points so you may be thinking why isn't he playing fireball well he can't he doesn't have enough points anymore a brain geyser also three points so it's really difficult here to make the right decisions but i guess eric made all the uh, good decisions here because he's in the final you know so he knows what he's doing and of course regrowth ancestral recall if you if you can get that uh, to go off i mean that's extremely powerful that's just a lot of cards and regrowth of course in general a very powerful card and maybe even more so in a singleton format and it's only one point so it's kind of nice it's like easy to add to your list uh, this integrates two points a little bit less pointed than uh, than the fireball and that's why he can play the disintegrate and not the fireball because fireball is three points now when we're looking at the rest of the list we just see a really different strategy than the uh, control deck that we looked at earlier of juan this is really a creature heavy deck supported by direct damage right he wants to really play a creature every single turn deal damage every single turn and then finish the job with direct damage right we see uh, a hurricane we see earthquake we see detonate uh, you know, we just see a lot of ways to deal damage. We've got a Timmy that you can tap to deal damage. Of course, at Disintegrate, we mentioned before. Um, so we've got the If Biff Afrit, which is a build-in hurricane effect. If Biff Afrit is really, in my opinion, still one of the most underestimated cards. I do understand why it's difficult to fit into some decks because it's double green. I get it. Because it's got three toughness. I get it. But when you're ahead and you are able to play this creature... It can do absolute miracles for you you know if you've got the right deck for this card it's an amazing card and it can grant you the victory and and nothing is more frustrating for an opponent than when you're ahead in life you play your if biff and every single time you just pay a green on the end step or two green deal two damage to everything you know and, and you're you're ahead in this scenario and then when he's low enough and you've got enough green you can just finish it on the spot so there's just this constant pressure for your uh, opponent so again if biff afrit i think it's a really really good card um, i'm also liking the falling star here uh, in this deck especially against juan because we saw juan is playing with a lot of those smaller creatures right the witch hunter the preacher the old man of the sea a lot of ways to steal uh, a creature so they're good but they're also vulnerable to an earthquake but also to a falling star so it, it would be really cool to see eric flip his uh, his falling star here in the in the finals okay so this is the list of eric we looked at the list of juan i mean i'm not as super like i'm not a specialist of the format when i compare it to your, your regular old school there's a pretty big chance that the control player is going to win it because it looks kind of like the deck but i mean looking at this deck here of eric it's looking very fierce that combination of early creature pressure with all that damage that he can deal through his spells it, it, it's looking just very very solid and i'm not sure if juan can go fast enough 
you know, to survive long enough to play his control game. You know, that's going to be the big question here of this bash between these two titans, you know, Eric and, uh, and Juan. So I really think it's a 50-50 here. Let me know in the comments below who your favorite is and why. And uh, yeah, I'm always interested to read it and, uh, and let me know what you think of the decisions uh, that both of these players have made in their deck building. Okay, um, we talked about the deck of Eric. We talked about the deck of Juan. That means we can only do one more thing. And that is, let's go to the match. The finals of Seven Point Singleton right here in Madrid, Spain, 2023. Let's go. Game number one of the 2023 Seven Points Singleton Finals in Madrid, Spain. On the left, Juan playing with his deck. Red deck wins. It's a blue-white control deck. Taking on Eric Ostman from Sweden. He's playing a deck with red, blue, and green called Rug Beats. And it looks like both players are taking a mulligan here. So going down to six in hand. There's a forest and a pass. We see a... What do we see in hand there for Eric? It's kind of hard to see. Another forest, I believe. And there is a Wiley Wolf, turn number two. So a 1-1 one, one from Arabian Nights. You can tap it to give target creature plus one, plus one. It can also give itself plus one, plus one. And we see Juan playing another land, passing the turn. There's the first damage dealt here by Eric. Juan dropping to 19. Let's see what else is going to happen here. There's another land, altered by Jesper Mirforce, I believe. It's a basic planes. No action yet from Juan. Another attack by the Wolf. 18. Also no more pressure by... Eric, it looks like Eric really needs a red source there. I see some direct damage in hand. There is the Witch Hunter. So the first creature being played by Juan here in the finals. Witch Hunter, a card from the dark. It can deal one damage to your opponent, but also it can bounce creatures. Here we see the red source chain lightning on the hunter. There's the attack and Juan dropping to 17. The good news here for Juan though is that, I mean, Eric is going very, very slow. And remember, he's got a more aggressive strategy. The longer the game takes, the better it probably is here for Juan. There we see a Sarah Angel, turn five. Oh, look at that, taken care of. This is a really important top deck here by Eric, or maybe it was in his hand, I don't know, but this was an important uh, answer here to that Sarah Angel. So Sarah's gone. There we see a Preacher, though, hitting the board. So the Preacher can steal the Wolf next turn. We do know that... Um, Eric has, I believe, an Earthquake in hand or not. Maybe I saw that wrong. There's the attack offering the trade. There's a Rock of Courageous passing the turn. Yeah, he's got that Earthquake. So one of the things that he could do is use the Wolf to pump itself. Oh, look at that. Control Magic on the Rock. Passing the turn. Not yet using the Preacher. And this is difficult now for Eric. Does have a regrowth, could regrowth, for example, the chain and kill the rock, but then that's a two for one and you're losing one of your best cards in your deck to regrowth. He also has a disintegrate, could disintegrate the rock. And uh, what I wanted to say about the earthquake scenario, one of the things that he could do is use the Wailuli Wolf to pump itself, make it a two, two plain earthquake for one and that way killing the preacher. And then next turn, potentially, he could find a way to deal with the uh, Rock of Corriches. Now, of course, the problem with the color combination of Eric is that it's really hard for him to deal with a Control Magic. Oh, look at that Earthquake for four. So he's really saying, I am the aggressor in this matchup. And uh, I am happy to kill my own wolf if that means that I can deal additional damage to you here. So uh, Eric dropping to 16, Juan dropping to 11. And of course, both players losing here a creature. The Preacher for Juan and the Wailuli Wolf here for Eric. And there's that Rock of Corriches that can now attack. Put him on 13. I'm expecting an attack here. Would be surprised if we don't see an attack. And I think what Eric here is thinking, because he has to regrowth and he has to disintegrate, he just wants to deal as much damage with direct damage here as he can, can possibly do. I wouldn't be surprised if he plays a disintegrate on the life total of Juan next turn. That would drop him to 7. Then, you know, hopefully... Ooh, this is important. Strip mine on the mountain. This is so important, this strip mine. This is a big problem here for Eric. He needs that mountain. Oh, this is a big problem for him. There's the pass. Pendlehaven coming a little bit too late. That would have been so sweet in combination with the Wailoli Wolf earlier in the game. More problems here. There's an IO, IO pile. More problems for Eric dropping to 10. It's not looking good for him. 
I mean, he's got the regrowth. He could regrowth the mountain, play disintegrate for three on his own creature, but you don't want to do that. But maybe you're forced to do that. Yeah, look at that. Taking back his own mountain. Oh, that's so painful. Okay, there's a, a detonate there for two. Then, of course, in response, Juan can, I believe, use his pile to deal two damage exactly to Eric. Eric dropping to eight. I believe he had a disintegrate in hand. Maybe I was wrong, though. So the pile is gone. There will probably be an attack here by the Rock of Courageous, meaning Eric will drop to five. And I mean, that strip mine on the mountain, I think that was, that was so important here. Because now Eric needed to use his regrowth. Oh, man, this is, again, a really good play. The Spirit Link really helps against these aggressive decks. That means Eric's on five and Juan went back up to 14. Oh, it's looking really bad here for Eric. He's a little miracle. Okay, there's the Disintegrate. And I mean, that's kind of good now, right? Because it means Juan is losing uh, two cards now, the Control Magic and the Spirit Link. So at least it's a two for two. Ooh, there's Papa Modi, Mahamoti Jin hitting the board. This is huge. There's the if bit for free. The problem here for Eric, of course, is he has to block. So he has to chump with the if bit, one of the best creatures in his deck. And I'm sure he's won plenty of games with the if bit. Oh, bouncing it, attacking, winning here with Papa Modi. Game number one going to Juan Jerez with his deck. Red deck wins. Now both players are going to shuffle back up and now we're going to go to game number dos. Game number two is about to begin, and oh man, that game one, it was short, but I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. There was a lot of interaction going on, and, uh, and Eric was closer to that victory again. If I think of that strip on the mountain didn't happen, but I guess that's magic, right? If, if, if. Anyway, Eric now on the play. Let's see if he's got a turn one. No, he doesn't. A forest and a pass. Underground sea and a pass. Oh, there we go. There are the Fire Sprites, I believe, right? There's a 1-1 one, one Flyer from Legends, and you can pay a green and tap it to make a red mana. There we see the Desert. That's a really good answer, actually, to that early damage. There's a Spitting Slug, one of the better creatures in the dark, 2-4. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a 2-4 body for 3 mana. What's not to like? There's also some kind of First Strike Clause on the card that's, uh, that's quite interesting. If you attack with it and you don't pay a green and one, it means the creature that's blocking it gets first strike, but if you pay the, the, the green and the, and the one, then the spitting slug gets first strike. So I guess if you pay the mana, the slug starts to spit and gets the first strike advantage. I love the flavor of that. Um, let's see if Juan can do something, by the way. It looks like uh, a little bit distracted, perhaps, or just in the tank. Seems to be looking at the phone there. Okay, there's a strip mine. Taking care of the Hammerheim. So, I mean, we can see a pattern here, right? Something that Juan's doing really well is kind of attacking that mana base, especially red. There's the uh, attack here. I guess he had the red mana floating then earlier from the Often Troll. It's not quite clear. Oh, of course, he's using the Sprite to play the Often Troll. Of course. That's actually really cool tech. So, uh, he's using that ability of the Fire Sprites. To make a red mana and, and cast that often troll. Just, just put extra pressure on the board. Juan at the moment on 18, so still pretty high up. For a moment there, it looked like Juan wanted to discard the Sarah Angel, by the way. But um, had a land, so didn't have to. And that Sarah is looking really good, but he's still two turns uh, away from casting that Sarah. If, of course, he can then play a land every single turn. So it looks like he's a little bit in the tank here. Trying maybe to figure out a way to kind of stop the bleeding here. I mean, next turn he's looking at four points of damage, which is not the end of the world. Okay, there's a Disrupting Scepter. Disrupting Scepter is good, but slow. There is a Birds of Paradise. Okay, that Birds could be quite good. Look at that attacking with everything, of course, because Juan tapped down the desert, so he can also attack with that 1-1 Flyer. So five damage instead of four, he now dropped to 13. There is a Disrupting Scepter activation. I think this is actually good news if you're Eric. If this is the best thing that he can do, it means that next turn you can swing in again. And look at that. He's 
step down the desert. Does that mean that maybe he's got a Swords to Plowshares in hand to cast on the Spinning Slug or the Often Troll? There's the attack here. Tapping a white. Yep, there's the Swords, of course, on the Regeneration creature. Does mean two more life for Eric. Can Eric do something? He needs to put more pressure on. Yep, he can. Okay, there's a War Mammoth 3-3 three, three Trampler. And what I always like is when you put a Giant Grove on your War Mammoth and kind of make a little mini Force of Nature. It's always one of the things that I love to do as, as a little Timmy. Back in the day when I started playing. Uh, still a cool creature. I mean, Trample is a really good ability. And uh, it's only one green and three, so only that one green makes it easy to cast. Which is important, of course, if you're playing a three-color deck. There we see, again, the Disrupting Scepter activation. Eric dropping a land here from his hand, so that's not too bad. And what I notice is Juan, again, is tapping down his desert. So now he can swing in with the 1-1 one, one Flyer. And are we going to see, yep, there's a Boomerang, of course. And look at the life total of Juan. He's already on six. I mean, this is looking really, really good. And Eric can just recast the War Mammoth here. Exactly. And next turn, again, put some pressure on. And I think if you're Juan, you really want to, you know, use that uh, Mishra's Factory now on blocking duty. You can trade it for the War Mammoth or use it to block the uh, Spitting Slug because, of course, the Mishra's Factory can pump itself. So you can make it into a 2-2, declare blocks, and then before damage is dealt, you can tap it to pump itself. Then it's a 3-3. And it deals 3 damage, and of course, it's got 3 toughness. So that way, it could uh, bounce back from the Spitting Slug, or you can trade it with the War Mammoth. And you can see him thinking here what to do. Should I use the Disrupting Scepter? The problem here is if he does, then he's got a City of Brass, a Desert, and a Mishra's Factory. And then he needs a City of Brass to activate the Factory, probably. That means another point of damage. And he's already on 6. He's quite low. Ooh, he's going to do it, though. There's an Old Man of the Sea. He's going to drop to 5. This Old Man is looking really good on this board, by the way. Old Man of the Sea, card from Arabian Nights. You can tap it to steal a creature with equal power or less. And it's a 2-3 creature, so it can steal, for example, the Spitting Slug. So Eric needs to find a way to kind of kill Juan right now. He can, of course, attack with the War Mammoth and the Spitting Slug and also the Flyer. You know, the worst case is that he loses the Flyer, but remember, with Desert, you first take the damage. Yeah, I think this is the best block here. Oh, there's Hurricane closing the game. Hurricane here winning it for Eric. And Eric, this is what Eric wants to do, right? Just keep playing out creatures. And what I really liked about this game is that he could use that little 1-1 one, one flyer to create the red mana because that was, again, very important uh, for him to cast that off control just to put a little bit of extra pressure on the board here. And here we could also see for Juan the problems that he had. Yes, the Disrupting Scepter was giving him card advantage, but he was just going too slow. Couldn't find the bigger answers, right? He had the swords for the one-for-one -one trade, but couldn't find uh, the mode, couldn't find the wrath or the balance. He kind of needed those kind of cards to get out of it. But um, I'm happy because it means it's 1-1 and we're going to go to game number three. Game number three here, the big decider. Who is going to be the world champion in Seven Point Singleton here in Madrid, Spain? And it looks like Eric is going to take uh, a mulligan here. Going to go down to six. He's on the draw, of course, after winning that second game. There we see a Tundra in the pass. I see Birds of Paradise, turn one. That's not too shabby, Eric. Forest Birds. Looks like he's got more options, though. Maybe the card on the left, could that be... Maybe it's a 1-1, one, one, right? And you just want to put pressure on your opponent. Going for the birds, passing the turn. Let's see what Juan can do. Another duel, passing the turn. There's a red source. And yep, there was an Elves of Deep Shadow. So he was thinking about or birds or Elves of Deep Shadow. I understand that he needed a moment because, of course, the, the Elves means instant pressure. Interesting, yeah, he can attack, kind of trying to lure Juan to activate the factory, but he sees through the, the plan here of Eric. Going to drop to 19. Because, of course, Eric was hoping that uh, Juan would uh, animate the factory and then he could play a psionic blast there in hand. Ooh, there's a strip. That's actually quite good. Exactly, stripping it. Attacking. And he could consider one of the lines he could have done as well here is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the maze, but now he can regrowth 
exactly regrove the strip, strip the mace. And one of the lines that I wanted to talk about is he could have used the strip to, uh, for example, take one of the dual lands out of the equation, um, you know, and then try to attack the mana base of Juan after that again with uh, with the regrove because he has, of course, that Sionic Blast and try to uh, to lure Juan into activating the uh, the factory. But I'm sure if you're Eric, of course, you want to use that Sionic Blast way more aggressively. Here we see an Azur Drake being played by Juan, by the way, a really good blocker. Could be a good target for the uh, Psionic Blast. Exactly. It's a 2-4 Vanilla. Well, Vanilla, it's got Flying, but just a 2-4 Flyer. It's got a really cool flavor text, by the way. There we see a Flower Stone being dropped here by Eric. I think Eric is doing okay, but not better than okay, because he doesn't have the pressure that, for example, he had in Game 2. Needs to find some more creatures. There's a COP Red. That is a pretty good card here for Juan. That's going to protect him from all those direct damage spells. Of course, it's not going to protect his creatures. But I remember Juan is in this for the long game. And I think if you're Eric, you're kind of hoping for maybe a Pendlehaven here or just more creatures. You just want to slam a big creature on the board. Of course, not a red one because of that COP red. But War Mammoth would be good. You know, Surrender Perfreed, whatever, you know, just some more pressure on the board. Can't seem to find it though. So this is good news for Juan who's still on 14. Eric on 18, it's uh, Juan's turn at the moment, is in the tank here. He's got five mana, quite a lot. What would be great for Juan here is to, you know, for example, find a book or a Disrupting Scepter to kind of get that card advantage train going. Passing the turn here, finding a Strip Mine. There's the attack for one again, so he's going to drop to 13. Using the Felwer here. Okay, what is he going to play? Has he found another creature? There's the Azur Drake on the side of Eric. So both players are playing with Azur Drake. 2-4 Flyer from Legends. Oh, there's the Mana Drain. So look at how important it is that he's going to use the Mana Drain here on the Azur Drake. Understanding the importance for him to make this into a long game. And there he's, he's going to go playing a Tetravus. A 4-4 Flyer from Antiquities. And during your upkeep, you can take the plus one plus one counters off to make one one flying Tetra Vites because it's actually a one one for six, but comes into play with three plus one plus one counters. There's the pass. Ooh, this is a bit of a problem for Eric. Not huge yet. He's still on 18. He's got time. I believe I saw a detonate in hand, by the way, for Eric. Which is quite nice. He does have enough mana now to fire off the detonate. Ooh, gonna go for a Fisher instead. There's a Power Sink though. Ooh, taking it back. Changing his mind. He's gonna let it resolve. But now, of course, Eric knows about the Power Sink. So not an ideal situation for Juan. And I believe I saw, yeah, there is a Detonate in hand for Eric. Now remember, uh, the damage that Detonate deals to, um, to Juan can be uh, prevented by the Circle of Protection Red by Juan, so I think that's the reason why Eric went here for the uh, the Fisher and not for the Detonate. The problem, of course, now is that the, you know the Fisher you can use on any creature, but the Detonate you can only use on artifacts. So it is a bit limited in uh, in uh, how you can use the card. There's a tap for seven, oh for six actually. Wow, Desert Twister here. On the Witch Hunter and again an attack. I mean, that that Elves of Deep Shadow is doing work. You know, Alanis Morissette is, is working it here in this match. There we see uh, a counter spell here on the 1-1. One, one. Oh, there's a Disrupting Scepter taking care of the Detonate. That's unfortunate for Eric. Could have used the Detonate, of course, the following turn on the Scepter. That would have been quite nice for him. There's a War Mammoth, actually a pretty good draw. Some extra pressure on the board here, meaning he can attack him for four a turn. I mean, look at the life total of Eric. He's already on 10. So he's got he's to think about his life total. Tapping five here, what are we going to see? There's an Air Elemental. Yeah, that makes all the difference. So Eric wants to find some removal here. Disintegrate would be really sweet. Take care of the air elemental swing for four and put uh, Juan on uh, on six in that case. But what is that one card in hand there for Eric? Who is gonna attack? 
So kind of challenging Juan here. The question is, does Eric have, for example, a giant growth in hand? And this is a good deal for Eric if he has a giant growth in hand, because if he doesn't, you know, and Juan decides not to not to block, you know, three damage. If he does have the giant growth, he can make it into a 6-6. Six, six. And then if he blocks, of course, kill the air elemental. But if he doesn't block, deal six damage, which is also fine. Because, you know, when you're at four, you know, four is a lot less than 10, obviously. And uh, then it starts to get a little, uh, little dangerous for Juan. Remember, this is game number three. The winner is going to be the champion. Yep, putting the air elemental in front. No giant growth, though. What are we going to see? An if biff for free. And he can now pay one with the if biff. Kill the air elemental. Really, really good. It is going to kill the bird. But this if biff for free could mean the victory for Eric here. Remember, Eric's on 17. Juan's on 9. I mean, Juan needs to destroy this if biff for free. He has to find a way. He's on 9 at the moment. Next turn, he could be dropped down to... To six to five even because you also have the elves of deep shadow. Then he can deal two extra points of damage with the if if he would drop down to three. This is a big problem here for Juan. You can see him think. What can he do here? Tapping five. There's a Sarah Angel. Okay, at least he's got a blocker. But I mean, it doesn't matter. Eric can still deal some damage. Remember, if Biffa Free does his building hurricane effect, so he can pay a green, deal one damage to any target. However, while I'm saying this, I'm realizing that his opponent, Juan, can do the same. Everybody can use this ability on the if Biffa Free. Of course, Juan only has one forest at the moment because of that tropical island. If he can find more forests, he could also kill the if Biff. The problem, of course, for Juan here is that he's on nine. It's looking quite good here for Eric, but this is a this is a complicated board state for sure. Next turn, I'm expecting, uh, of course, Juan to swing in with the Sarah Angel. But first, let's see what Eric's going to do on this turn. Could be a crucial turn here in this match. I would love to know what that one card is in his hand. Not sure how many cards Juan still has, by the way. Must be uh, getting low, maybe even top decking, not quite sure. And remember, if you're Eric, you really want to play out the card in hand because your opponent has that disrupting scepter. So dealing one point of damage with the if biff, realizing that he cannot do two because then Juan, of course, can use his trap, kill the if biff that way. So again, good magic by Eric, only doing it for one. Juan now on eight. And it looked like a pass turn here, but perhaps Juan wants to do something on end step. There's the untap. Okay, so let's see what Juan can do in his turn. Expecting him to attack here with the Sarah. But there are many lines here. Perhaps he first wants to use the Disrupting Scepter to see what cards in, the, in hand there of Eric. Yep, using the scepter first. What card is an earthquake? Of course, I won't say why didn't he play it, but remember, oh, this is big. This is big. This spirit link on the if biff is huge. This is a game changer here. And what I wanted to say about the earthquake is, of course, it didn't make sense for Eric here to, uh, to play out the earthquake because... Um, uh, because of the COP red. And what we're seeing here happening, by the way, is you're, maybe you're wondering why is Juan gaining life? That is because of that if biff Frit. Because he gains one point of life for each damage dealt by, uh, this, by the, the if biff Frit to any target, right? So if you're dealing a damage to flyer number one, flyer number two, flyer number three, that's already three life. Plus the, 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 the life gain you get from the damage dealt to the players. So now we see Eric, or sorry, Juan being on 21, which is pretty insane. And I mean, the tables have really turned. That spirit link made all the difference here. The question is, can Eric get back from this? Both players are kind of in top decking mode. We do see two cards in hand there for Juan, it seems. 
There's the attack, pumping it up, de dealing two damage. So Eric's gonna drop to 19. Sorry, Juan's gonna drop to 19. Eric's still on 16. Eric finding more pressure. This is not too bad for him. I mean, yes, Juan's all the way back up, you know, to, to, to 19 in this case. But if Eric can, can hit the right top decks, he can get somewhere. But of course, the Granite Gargoyle, not as good because of the COP red. But still, I mean, it's something. Worst case scenario, it's a decent blocker. There's another planes. Two cards still in hand, I believe, for Juan here. Passing the turn. Would love to see what those two cards are, by the way. Again, two damage dealt. Eric passing turn, so that card is probably going to lose to the Disrupting Scepter. There's the Scepter activation. Forest gone. Yeah, this is something you can do as well. If, if it's just a land that you don't need, you can simply keep it in hand and to kind of, you know, let your opponent use three of his mana in his main phase. Because remember, the Scepter can only be used at sorcery speed. Oh, there we see, of course, that uh, Power Sync that we saw a while ago. Power Syncing the Urnum Jin, which is quite important here for Juan. And there's the untap. I wonder if Eric still remembered that Power Sync. Then again, if he would have kept it in hand, he would have lost it to the Scepter. So he had to play it out anyway. And uh, it, it, I mean, at least the Power Sync's out of the way now. And that's, of course, something that the Disrupting Scepter does. It, it forces you to play out your cards immediately in this, uh, in this top decking scenario. There's the attack again. And look at that. Juan dropping here all the way down to 13. Are we going to see... Oh, a hurricane here. A huge hurricane. So both players dropping drastically. And I guess the, uh, the Gargoyle is going to die exactly to the hurricane. But uh, it wasn't doing much anyway. There we see an old man of the sea. That could be a problem here for Eric. If he cannot find an answer that old man can steal the Wailuli Wolf. There is a, an off control. So one of the things that uh, Juan can do here is steal the off control. Remember, he's got red mana, so that would be quite good for him. And then he will have a 2-2 regenerator. I mean, it's, look, it's looking really good here for, uh, for Juan, actually. There's the pass, end of turn. I'm going to steal it. And then in response, Eric could use the Wailuli Wolf, make it into a 3-3, and then he can no longer steal it with the old man. Exactly. But now, of course, next turn he's going to untap, and then he can steal it. But that's some interesting uh, shenanigans going on with the Wailuli Wolf. And Juan here deciding to steal the wolf. There's the book. This book. This book is probably going to give him the victory. Eric really needs some good top decks here. Rock of Courage is not going to do it. That COP red has been on the table since turn two, I believe. It's, it's, it's so good here for Juan in this game three. What's important for Eric now... In my opinion, the first point of business is getting rid of the old man of the sea. You just kind of have to accept that your opponent is going to have some card advantage going. Um, you know, and you just got to hope that you can take care of the old man and then, you know, put enough pressure on the board to just uh, win with the tax. There's the uh, AO pile. This is actually quite, could be quite useful. The Spendelhaven could pump the Elves of Deep Shadow to a 2-3. The problem, of course, is that then Juan can block on his wolf, can kill the wolf, and can then, you know, use his old man again to steal the often troll or to steal the, the Elves of Deep Shadow. Looks like Eric's going to keep this card in hand. It's look, I mean, it's looking... And this is what control decks do, right? You're like, you're winning... And then all of a sudden the game shifts and you kind of slowly see the game slipping out of your hands. That's probably what Eric's feeling right now. And I, I just have to keep thinking back about that moment when, uh, you know, Juan played that Spirit Link on the If Biff and Freak. And he went, I think it was on six or five or whatever. And he went all the way back up to nine or ten. And, and after that, even back up to 21. Uh, that was huge. That Spirit Link was really huge for Juan and, and really got him back into the game. 
and now it looks like he's going to win. You know, he's got and the Jam Day Tome and the Disrupting Scepter on the board and that Circle of Protection uh, red. Just so many, so many good value cards here for Juan. There's the Island of Wak Wak. Really cool card from Arabian Nights. You can tap it to give target uh, flying creature, reduce target flying creature's power to zero. And there's the Scepter activation. Okay, there's the Bolt. I think I would have bolted. I get this because then he can attack, I guess. I think I would have bolted the Old Man of the Sea, right? Because if you bolt the Old Man of the Sea, you get your wolf back. Or am I missing something? There's the attack, but of course he could use the Wailuli Wolf. It was untapped, I assume. Yeah, he could use the Wailuli Wolf to make the Old Man 3-4, of course. That's why he didn't do it. So I was missing something. Yeah, because then the bolt, of course, doesn't work anymore. So this bolt was the right decision to make by Eric. Because it meant that he could at least attack with the, uh, with the elves, deal some damage. And now, of course, uh, we see Juan, you're stealing another creature, the Often Troll. Ooh, Phantom Monster. I mean, if it doesn't get countered, uh, it gets countered. It gets countered. I mean, a 3 3 blue flyer, and, and you know, Juan's on, on five. There's the bounce effect. There's the attack. Yeah, really wants to get in here for damage. Eric dropping here to six, I believe. There's a Chaos Orb. Yeah, and this is really, really Juan's game to lose right now. There we see a Tim, though. At least Tim can ping a little bit. One of the things exactly he can untap. If he untaps, he loses control, right? Of the often troll. So he has to keep that old man tapped. And I think this is what both players are kind of discussing. Because the situation was Eric was on six. Then there was the swords on the Tim. So he goes back up to seven. Then there's the attack with the often troll. He drops to five. But you cannot attack with the old man, of course. Exactly. You need to keep the old man tapped. Okay, so now they're kind of rewinding the clock. So he's now on seven. So the Timmy is gone with the swords. Then there will be the attack. Or is the Timmy coming back as well? So it's, it's a bit messy. Okay, there's the attack dropping to five. There's the uh, ghost ship, two for flyer. Eric finding it. Nope. And uh, Juan winning it here because, of course, he has that psionic blast. So uh, one of the things that he can do here while they're celebrating, uh, one of the things that, uh, that uh, he could do are simply just attack with uh, with the ship and then play the psionic blast win the game so congratulations here to juan for for winning it here with your red deck wins deck which is actually not red you know so uh, here is the winning deck again congratulations juan for being the world champion of seven point singleton 2023 Love it, love it, love it. Um, just a, a big a big thank you to the Seven Point Singleton community for sharing this uh, video uh, with me. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a lot of uh, a lot of fun, you know, to look at these games. Now, if you also have cool games, interesting games, you can always send me an email. You can always uh, share it with me, and I can I can have a look. There's a probably uh, the email address probably shown here in the, in the video's description. Now, before you go, please take a moment to like, comment, and share on this video. All these three things are free and really help the channel move forward. And then before you go, you can also consider becoming a patron of the show via patreon.com slash timmytalks. And by becoming a patron, you're sponsoring Timmy Talks, the channel, so you're helping me to continue making this content for you, to continue making old school magic videos. And uh, you can already become a patron for just $1 a month. And for that $1, there are some really cool perks because you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord and your name will be mentioned in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Rise!
Somebody can sing. <laughs>